Right, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of SCBO Sentinel Oscar to this session for Cyber Scotland Week. My name is Alison Stone. I'm the Cyber Resilience Coordinator based at SCBO. Um, we've got a, a great session ahead for us. Uh, we've got some, some really, really interesting reflections um, on something that has happened before and some really good advice coming from Oscar and our, our resident expert, Jim, on crisis communications. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, this session is going to be recorded, um, so we will be sharing the recording publicly. Uh, we would encourage you, if you find anything really particularly interesting, to share it with your colleagues, and we will put it onto the Oscar website um, after the event. Um, there is quite a lot of us today, so we would encourage you to stay mute um, whilst people are talking, but we do want to hear from you. Um, and do feel free to put any questions in the chat as we go along. Don't store them up until the end. Uh, if you hear something that you think, oh, I want to chip in on that, please absolutely do. And it will be it will be addressed as as it comes in. Um, do feel free to uh, tweet about the event today. Um, anything that is inspiring or interesting that you want to share with the, the, the whole wide world, that would be wonderful. Um, and also, as this is a Cyber Scotland Week event, um, if you could use the hashtag CSW2021, um, that would be fantastic for us as well. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. Um, first of all, we have Jim Preben. Jim is a crisis manager and is the crisis management <coughs> director at UDO, where he provides client-specific advice on all crisis communications, designs and delivers crisis simulation exercises, and deals with crisis communication plans. He also trains media um, senior executives. Previous to, to his current life, he was a journalist working at the ABC News, where he, went, where he covered stories around the Gulf War and the Bosnian conflict. He's also won two Emmys for his work, so we're delighted to have him with us today. Uh, we also have an input from Martin Tyson. Martin is the Head of Regulation and Improvement at Oscar, which is the independent regulator for more than, I think it's 25,000 charities now. Um, he leads Oscar's main outward facing functions, um, which over includes overseeing delivery and continuous improvement for the Oscar regulatory casework and its work within the charity sector and key stakeholders to improve and build public confidence in the, the charities we have in the sector. Um, guys, it's, it's over to you. Um, I think you've got a lot to say. I think it's really, really interesting. Um, we're in for a good session. So crack on. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your kind introduction there, Alison. Um, yeah, today we're talking about Martin's involvement um, with an investigation into a cyber breach and subsequent fallout at a charity called the Institute for Statecraft. That's going to be the focus of our attention today. Before we get to that, can I just reiterate what Alison said? Please put any questions that you have as we go along in the chat box, which you should see in front of you on your computer. And I will put these questions to Martin. Hopefully he will be able to uh, answer them for you. So, um, um, questions as we go, please. Um, we want plenty of questions if we can get them. Um, but before we get to that, um, I just want to um, launch a poll. Um, just and ask you, uh, just sort of take the temperature of our audience, see where we're at. Um, and I'm going to do my best to launch a poll now. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, we want you to vote on this, please. Um, Right, okay, stop sharing. I need to get this right. Okay, I need to, no, okay, hang on a second. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm gonna relaunch this poll, which asks the question, have you had to respond to a cyber attack at any time? Um, we'd like you to all respond to this, please, in, in whatever way, shape or form, however senior or junior you were, have you had actually had to respond to a, a, a cyber attack? I, I'm guessing I probably know this, I can probably guess the answer a bit here. Um, I think just about everybody, 76%, 80% of people have voted. Anybody else want to jump in? Last dibs for this, and I'm going to end this poll because we need to crack on 84 percent people so i'm ending the poll now and i'm going to share the results and i'm hoping that you can see the re, um the, re, the response here uh, and 14 percent have actually had to respond to a cyber attack and actually I, I, yeah, 86 percent um have um have not had to do so. I, I must admit, I would, Martin, I don't know about you, but I was expecting it slightly higher than that. But I guess, you know, actually responding to a cyber attack is still relatively rare. Any quick thoughts on that for us? 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's something that's become less rare, and, and I think you, you might be saying it's, it's uh, something that we've seen more of since the, the, the start of lockdown and, and, and charities uh, operating more online. But uh, yeah, I, I, that might have been you know, pretty much around what I'd expected. Anyway, we have some good information about you for you about cyber attacks today, so you can learn if you are ever involved in one. I was um, during um, I, I saw this piece of information. A report was recently published to say that there had been a 600% increase in reported phishing emails since uh, lockdown began, with many of them cashing in, obviously, and on the pandemic. I had a couple of phishing emails recently, um, trying to extract money from me for. Um, uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, this was fairly widely reported on the BBC and elsewhere. Um, and let's hope they didn't get away with anything. They're a hor horrible, horrible thing. So, but this leads me to my second poll um, of, of the morning. Um, and I'm going to, oh yeah, I didn't share those results, but there you go. So I'm going to stop that. I'm now going to, how do I, yeah, here we go. I'm going to ask you another question on poll two and I'm launching this poll have you noticed an increase in phishing attacks and other suspected cyber crime activity in the in the recently is this something that you've noticed so please if you could um, vote on that see if um, that research that I referred to a moment ago is accurate or not um, I've certainly noted, I mean, the one thing I would say about this, Martin, uh, is that um, they're pretty good these days, some of these phishing attacks. In days gone by, you know, you could check them out for poor spelling or poor punctuation. Sometimes I really think, oh my goodness, is this actually real or not? Have you, you any thoughts on that? Well, I think that well, maybe the interesting thing here is uh, how many not sures we get. Because uh, I, I think the, the, the times when I've seen these, and, and you know, that's what it's turned out to be, there's been a, a lot of uncertainty. And you're, you're sort of peering at these uh, these emails uh, quite hard, thinking, well, is that real or not? So, well, oh, even you, even you're finding that right. So yeah, I yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, we get a pretty resounding. I don't know. Hopefully, you can see these results that I, that I've put up there. So a pretty resounding yes, eighty six percent say that they have seen an increase in. Um, in uh, cyber activity and and, and uh, phishing emails and so forth. All right, enough of this. I hope you feel you're all involved in this now. That was my little trick with the polls. But we're going to get to our um, case study now. And we're talking today about the Institute for Statecraft. Now, first of all, because not all of you will know about this. So what I to do is just lay out the ground for you. Um, I, it's the information you can read there. I'm not going to read it all out. I'm just going to pick the bits that are most relevant. Um, Institute for Statecraft was set up in 2006 and it's its essential aim really was to help improve governments and statecraft in the public sector. Um, and this included um, police reform as well as conflict resolution, countering Islamic terrorism and countering disinformation. Um, some, something state, Statecraft set up was this integrity initiative, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And this was funded by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And the whole idea of the um, integrity initiative was to counter and raise awareness about disinformation that might be coming from countries such as Russia and China, and indeed extremist groups like um, IS. Martin, is there anything, before we get to the hack aspect of it, is there anything that you would want to add about um, Statecraft, or is that a good summary? of it i think that's the, the, the that's the the basics um i think you you, know, you had something that was quite a, a small charity for for a number of years and then it took on the, this new uh, quite quite major project and that was was i think where, where the issues uh, came from okay all right great well let's let's just move our story on a little bit now because unfortunately um Statecraft was hacked in, in a, a couple of years ago in 2018. Um, and companies' internal documents, uh, including salaries and employee contact lists, were published on the web. It all got pretty political as well because leaked documents were positioned to try and suggest that taxpayers' money was using um, taxpayers' money was being used to publish anti-Labour Party propaganda. Um, it all got pretty messy, frankly, and the Institute is still struggling to get back to full functionality. While the hack was going on, 
the hackers released a pretty provocative statement, to say the least. They said that we've warned the UK government that it must conduct an honest and transparent investigation into the activity of the Integrity Initiative and the Institute for Statecraft, the outrageously illicit use of the British taxpayers', taxpayers money to organise a smear campaign against Jeremy Corbyn and the entire Labour Party must not remain unpunished. So that's pretty disingenuous stuff coming from them, um, whoever these people were. Perhaps Martin can help us on that in a moment. So that's what they release. But of course, what they were trying to do there was this, um, which was to create headlines. And they certainly managed that. I've just put them together in this slide, a variety of headlines. I see, um, Martin, your, your uh, organization is mentioned, Scottish charity watchdog dams group that attacked integrity of politicians. So a whole slew of newspaper headlines. Um, and unfortunately for the Institute of Statecraft, things have not uh, finished yet. If you go to their website right now, um, as I've just done before I came on to make sure it was still true, they've basically got a holding set page there which says all content has temporarily been removed from this site. So there you are, that's a, a very quick canter through um, what happened to the who Institute of Statecraft is and are and and what happened to them and so really and Martin was like front and center of um of uh, the investigation into these activities so Martin uh, we would uh, like to get some information off you if we may please so how did it go with you when you were given this job and you had to investigate statecraft um how was it how did they engage with you in a forthright manner how did, how did that work for you they, they did and uh, I, I, one thing I'd, I'd highlight is that when they had the uh, the hack of their information that was back in in December 2018 what they did was uh, submit to us what's called a, a notifiable event report uh, and that's what we expect charities to do uh, if they have a, a significant uh, issue um, they told us what the issue was they uh, said what they were doing about it uh, and particularly uh, they spoke about the other uh, agencies that they involved that they'd gone to the uh, the information commissioner's office and to, to a number of other uh, agencies and uh, the you know that they, they undertook to, to to keep us in touch with that so that on that specific point yes that the, the, they engaged with us uh, they were proactive about that and that, that, was, that was you know in, in its way good um the, the unfortunate thing for them, as as uh, you've mentioned, is that there was quite a lot of other things going on as as well. And I, I would say uh, through the the, the inquiry, they, they engaged with us, and and that they were you know that, that there was no problem getting information and and, and engaging with them. Uh, right. About, I mean, w w when this event happened, were they pretty shocked by this? Was did it take them unawares? Um, they were, um, and I, I, I think probably the, what you had there was uh, two or three things happen at the same time because the uh, the hack happened uh, there was also the issue with uh, them uh, retweeting uh, an article that was uh, Sorry, when um, you say them who do you who are you referring the to the institute for statecraft oh, okay. uh, retweeted an article that was fairly derogatory about uh, jeremy corbyn in relation to his uh, stance on uh, on the russian regime um, and uh, there was a, a lot of, of publicity also about their operating location, uh, which appeared to be a, a sort of empty, disused mill somewhere in Fife. Um, so what which, they were saying, look, there's nobody working there. What, what, yes. what, uh, uh, what, okay. what's, what, what's going on? So that uh, there was quite a lot of media coverage uh, through uh, December and, and, and January. Um, so quite a lot of, the, of, of things happened there for them. Um, Obviously, uh, we were concerned about the data breach. We were concerned uh, equally about the the, uh, the 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 tweet and what that might indicate in terms of, of bias and, and and party political bias on, on on behalf of the charity. And I think we wanted to know what was behind this, what 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 the underlying uh, situation was. I mean, it, it kind of looked like, f from my reading of it, it looked like it seemed like there was pro-government bias from a charity that received government funding that they were basically trying to smear the opposition party. 
Yeah, I think that was the concern that we went into the, the inquiry with. I think what, uh, once we'd looked into it, the, the, the issue in a way was, was um, different, but you know, worrying in, in, a, in a different way. In I think the, the retweet had been um, essentially kind of casual. Um, the, uh, the, the, there had been a lack of control over the, uh, the, the, the charity's Twitter account. There was a, a lack of sort of policies as, as to what should go out through that um, and uh, what, was, you know, what, what, what was permissible. Um, and that was probably the, 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 you know, the more worrying thing and, and uh, what, had, what led us to look further into you know, how the charity was, was being run and, and in what the other issues were. Can can you tell us? I think you you may not want to tell us everything about this, but do you? What is your sense? Who were these people that that, that caused this hack? Where did where was the, Where did this hack come from? Um, I think that was never um, definitively established. Obviously, that the, the, there's a, a bunch of uh, you know different agencies, some of which I think you'll be talking about later on when we you were talking about the kind of. Uh, actions that, that people can take that looked into this, but you know it, it was a it was a, a malicious hack. Um, you can speculate about you know, where that came from in relation to uh, the, the charity's activities, which related to um, what are called state actors, whether that's uh, you know, Russia or other uh, countries. Um, but you know, the, 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 the point about uh, you know, the, 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 the hacks is that they you know, covered their, their, their trails you know, pretty well. Okay. I mean, one of the um, findings uh, that you made was that there was a kind of lack, lack of collective decision making and sort of actions and decisions weren't recorded by the charity trustees. And, and also that there was little oversight of their Twitter account, as we've kind of uh, dealt with already. Um, what, what, what was going on here? Can you enlarge on this a bit, please? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what had happened there is I, I kind of hinted at this at the beginning. Uh, what you had here was something that started off as, as, as quite a, a small charity doing some fairly sort of um, you know small scale things uh, had moved into a, a sort of different environment yeah. um, but the um, there was a, a lack of, uh, of structure uh, around how the, 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 the charity commit the, the charity uh, trustees went about their business uh, there was a lack of, of challenge there and there was a lack of oversight and and I think the the, the Twitter, uh, episode was was you know just one very sort of um, visible manifestation of that. Essentially, what, what the, trustee, the, the trustees what, what, didn't really know what was going on there. Right, is, 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 is the, the the you know the evidence that we had that they, they hadn't really thought about what the consequences of. Uh, a sort of uncontrolled and unmanaged use of the, the, the Twitter account, account might so be. What, what was it that they retweeted? Can you just remind us of that, Martin? Yes, the, 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 they'd retweeted an article from from another source. Uh, that, that 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 was it. You know, it was, it was a you know, it was, it was a, a, a sort of quite a simple thing, really. Um, I mean, do you think but, this was kind of an automated reach? Why would they have done that? What was no, going was, on? There? As, as uh, the, the, the information, uh, the, the, the evidence was that this, uh, the, the, the Twitter account, account was left to a, a relatively junior member of staff. Uh, yeah. There were no protocols uh, in place for what the account should be used for and what the, the, the sort of limits were, what was okay and what wasn't okay. That was the, the, the big problem we had with it. I, I think that's incredibly interesting, actually, because um, quite often more older people, perhaps such as myself, think, oh, young people understand, you know, about um, social media and so forth. We'll get the young people to do it. And of course, what you've got to bear in mind is that this is all about incident and emergency communication. And um, they might well know about uh, uh, social media and how to use it but the messaging you know must come from senior the, the messaging must be controlled right and and, and i think uh, it's you know it, it's also thinking about the, the environment that you're in uh, if you look right. at the the, the the business they were doing um and the the, the areas that they were in uh, there were specific risks uh to do with the, the 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 subject matter of what they were doing the the, the you know the people who were being funded by and the, the the area of activity that they were in uh that meant that you know you, you probably had to have a, a higher level of vigilance for how you were using uh you know social media 
how you were uh, treating your data uh, than uh, maybe in, in, in some other areas of activity or other environments. So it, you know, it was a, a lack of a, a sense of the specific risks and the specific vulnerabilities that they had. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I've got here with the, with the kind of follow up question is it, it's extraordinary. They were involved in cybersecurity, but seem to fail to recognize the risks that we all know about with social media. There seems a bit of an oversight there. There's, a, there's an irony here, and it, it's, it's one that, that, that that's maybe worth sort of tuning over a bit. Um, in the, the the sort of nine ten months before uh, the hack, uh, they'd had a, a they brought some new trustees on board, uh, and the the sort of level of, of discussion at, at trustee meeting I think meetings had, had improved quite a lot. And one of the outputs from that was, look, we need to do something about our cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, where they were was in the process of doing something about the, 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 the cyber security. And that may have uh, led to a, a sort of extra vulnerability. So that, 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 you know, that, that they were uh, dealing with one aspect of, of the, 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 the issues there, albeit you know, maybe a little bit late, um, but that, 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 that was the, the situation they were in when, when the hack happened. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, just, I see quite a few, uh, we've got quite a few new people joining just to say that if anybody has any questions about the topic that we're talking about, any questions or comments, suggestions, then please just pop them in the chat box and uh, we can put those questions to, uh, to, to Martin. Um, okay. Let's, um, let's just move on to my next question is, uh, and I've got, quite interested by this I, I read that you found that the charity was at risk of failing the charity test a i'd like to know what the charity test is and that sounds pretty serious so what was the problem there can you enlarge on that a little bit for us please martin the charity test but basically uh, for us to, to put a charity onto the scottish charity register and for a charity to stay on the register it needs to meet you know the, the legal tests for being a charity uh, and broadly speaking, that is, uh, it needs to have charitable purposes and it needs to provide public benefit. And there's, there's a bunch of things that we, you know, we talk about and, and consider when we're deciding whether public benefits there. Um, there was, uh, as we, we sort of went through and looked at their uh, activities and looked at the detail of their constitution, a uh, couple of big problems there. One is that uh, they were, the, the way their uh, charitable purposes were, uh, were written uh, led them to have some non-charitable purposes. Uh, but you know, more than that, I think particularly that um, integrity initiative project, which was the, the main thing that they were doing. Uh, you let's, know, just, let's just remind our audience, this was about trying to find, working on disinformation from other nation states. Disinformation right? and, and, and fake news and, and, and yeah. uh, working yeah. around that, raising awareness of that and, and combating it. Um, that, we, we looked at the detail of, of how they were undertaking that, um, what was involved, this involved setting up clusters of um, people uh, in various countries, uh, including Eastern Europe, uh, Islamic countries, and, and, and a, a number of, of areas, uh, setting up you know, uh, networks of people uh, who would uh, be writing and, and sharing those messages around disinformation and, and fake news. These are journalists, academics, um, you know, opinion formers, and, and, and the like. Right. So we looked at that, and we, we had a number of, of issues with that. The, the charity's main purpose is the advancement of education. And there's some requirements when a charity is undertaking the advancement of education, uh, that, that there's some specific things that they have to be doing. The activity that they do has to be sufficiently structured to actually be able to educate people. And we had some concerns about that. It, it seemed to be sort of very loosely put together and, and, and very hard to, to, to define what they were doing. There also has to be a, a sort of neutrality about uh, you know, the, the stance they have on what they're educating people about, you know, rather than it being, you know, we are pushing a view. Uh, it needs to be, you know, there needs to be a, a sort of balanced uh, view of, of uh, what they're, they're educating about. 
We also had some concerns about the level of private benefit there was to some of the trustees as opposed to the, the public benefit, the, any public benefit the charity was, was providing. So that, that there were a lot of issues there. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, what do you mean benefits to the trustees? Uh, basically, the, 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 the uh, payments that were being made yeah. to charity trustees. Uh, we were concerned about the level of those. And I think we're also concerned about how they've been decided on. And I think pulling the focus back a, a little bit. Yeah. This comes back to, I think, what was the, the, the main issue here, which is how the trustees were running the charity. Yeah. How were they taking these, these big decisions? How had they decided to, to get involved with the integrity initiative? Had they thought about how it fitted with their charitable purposes? How, how had they thought and decided on you know, the payments to, to charity trustees? And we, we had you know, real concerns about, about all of those things. I mean, would you would it be fair to say that you know the charity was a good idea? It was set out to do good work, but they were just not the right people running it. Um, I, I think that the the, um, the activity that they did in the the first few years of, of the charity's life that, that, that there were no great issues with that. Um, and I, I think looking at the the, the scale of, of of what they did and the nature of what they did, there, there, there are very few issues with that. I think what we m maybe saw with the Integrity Initiative was um, you know, what you see with a, a number of charities, and that is a kind of mission drift, a sense of, yeah. okay, well, let's go and do this uh, without fully thinking through and having sufficient challenge about uh, whether that actually furthers their charitable purposes. Right. And that's, you know, that, 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 that's... that's uh, not the, the the first time we've seen that, and I, I think you know that the, the, there'll, there'll be I'm sure people on the call who've had to make those decisions and 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 you know think about those things. What, why do you think the hackers attack them? What was attractive to to this organisation? You know, um, why, well, why did they become a victim? I, I think that the, you know depending on who the hackers were, and mm. as I say that the, 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 there's there's nothing conclusive about that. Um, there you know the. the, the you Were mean, they an easy target? Was it was it seen as an easy? I, I think that yeah. I, I think that that the, they're in a, a an area where um, people had a motive to attack them. They were, in, they were in a, operating in a very contested, uh, quite controversial area where they were. Uh, some of the messages they were putting out were ones that uh, people would dislike, would uh, find threatening or, or difficult. Mm. Uh, so there's there's a motive. Um, Clearly, they had vulnerabilities in in the way that they uh, they were holding their information and, and holding their data, uh, and the, the, there were vulnerabilities in their setup that you know, allowed people to to get in there. So I mean, that, it's that, interesting, that, isn't it? I mean, I, there's I the mean, motive and there's the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, cyber criminals are obviously extremely smart, and they you know they would monitor an agency like this before attacking them. Whether it do you think the agency was sending out sort of indications that you know, was particularly maybe with their use of Twitter, that they weren't as secure as they might be? Um, I wouldn't care to speculate about that. Uh, okay. I, I, I think that the you know, it's it's entirely possible they would have been targeted anyway. Right. Okay. Uh, All right. Just you. Know, I, I think that, and, and to my mind, that the, the key risk that, that that maybe wasn't recognised or wasn't recognised early enough was uh, just that the arena that they were in was likely to make them uh, a target. Right. Okay. Fine. So, any any other findings that you made that you would want to tell us about, Martin? Anything else? Yeah. I mean. Um, I think there are indications that the 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 charity was changing for for the better during 2018. Right. Uh, and some of the, the the issues that we'd seen, you know, previous to that, you know, the lack of challenge, the lack lack of, of oversight, were uh, starting to, to to be addressed. And that's that's one of the things that we very much you know took into account uh, when we, we we came to our conclusions. Um, but I, I think there were some major issues there. That, that, that there were some major uh, concerns in the way that the, that the charity trustees had, had, had uh, gone about their business, and the data breach and, and, and the hack, I suppose, were really the the the, the very visible manifestations of that. Um, I mean, where where we went with this, you recognise some of the, the the changes that they made and, and and some of the changes that you know that, that they discussed with us, and that included changes to the trustee body so some of the trustees stepped down 
uh, they changed their constitution to address some of those issues. And you know, the big thing was that they, they uh, withdrew from the integrity initiative and that uh, was going to be taken forward by a non-charitable company. Oh, right. A separate, okay. separate organisation. So, you know, uh, th 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 there was quite a lot of change there, uh, you know, uh, as we got to the, the, the end of the inquiry. So where are they now? Are they still, is it still operational? It's a, it, it, I mean, we, we uh, are aware that, they, that, that they're still operational, but the, the, uh, the you know, activities that they have now are closer to what they were doing before they took on the integrity initiative. And it's, it's okay. a rather small scale. So what what are the big takeaways this month? What 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 can our guests, people listening now, what can they take away from this? What what where, where were the major kind of mistakes they made? Just just talk us through, through the sort of takeaways from this, please. I, mean, it's, it's, I suppose some of the the, the takeaways are, are, are very traditional. You know, what, what you have here is uh, an issue with cybersecurity and an issue with the use of of, of online media. But what was underlying those issues was, was uh, you know, some very sort of um, traditional kind of steam powered uh, issues of uh, what the charity trustees were, were up to and, and how they were going about their business. Uh, you know, it's about you know, collective decision making. It's about all of the charity trustees taking part in decisions, about all the charity trustees being willing to challenge and 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 uh, have their, their say where there were concerns and it's about the the uh you know the charity trustees looking at all of what the charity does and you're looking at that with with, with a degree of the right degree of care and diligence and just because it, it's it's uh it's the the, the charity tw twitter account you treat that with that uh you know degree of tech, care and diligence you'd look at the, the money with or that, that you'd look at any other activity with it's not like running your own twitter account where you can punt out what you like and, and the risk is for you uh you know, you do you know, you're doing that on behalf of, of, of the charity and, and that needs to be done with with due caution and with a view of the risks that are there for your charity with the things that it does in the area that it's in yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, they it sort of seemed to start off quite well. But then they sort of entered, once they instituted the Integrity Initiative, they seemed to sort of step into shark-infested waters there. And perhaps that's what they were not prepared for. Um, I, I think that, 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 that that's a, a good way of putting it. It, it, it was a, a, a tough environment to be in. And the, the 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 sort of governance and and the the, the control there needed to be uh, up to the challenges of the environment that they were in, and I, I think you know in terms of you know, what the takeaway there is, that needs to be the same for 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 all charities. You know what are the challenges that you have in the, the area that you're in. Yeah, and I guess they just weren't aware of some of those challenges. Um, 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 just so, uh, yeah, uh, go on. one of the points that, that's come up from the chat there, and it, it's a really good one, and that's about having you know a sort of code of conduct uh, for, for you know trustees in, in in terms of communications, and that was one thing that was that was really lacking here. A, a sense of of the trustees having thought about what was okay and what wasn't okay. Uh, that 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 was really what was what was there behind the the, the, the Twitter issue. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. I just had a good comment from Julie um, on the chat function, where she highlights the importance of a code of conduct for trustees and having a communication strategy, policies and procedures. Well, I see they, I mean, was, was there a code of conduct for the trustees? Did they have a policy? Or was it just the wrong policy? Uh, no and no. Uh, is the answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, and right. Again, the, 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 you know, that's one of the things that you know they, they did address in, in in the course of our inquiry. They put in in policies in place uh, around Twitter. You know, you you asked at the beginning whether they engaged with us, and they, they did. 
but you know, that, that, that was kind of afterwards. I suppose, yeah, so after the stuff. event. Yeah, 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 indeed. Okay, well, that's great. I mean, if anybody's got any more points or questions to raise about the Institute for Straight Statecraft, please do. But in our remaining time, can we just broaden this out a little bit, Martin? In, mm. in the work that you do in the charity sector, what are the common mistakes that organisations make when it comes to cyber attacks and data breaches? Is it communications, use of social media? What, what, what are the typical things Things that you find pe where the, where people are at fault. I think it, it, it's you know it, it is very much the, the points we've been discussing. It, it, it's having a sense of what the vulnerabilities are. Yeah. Um, you know, I and mean, when we talked about uh, fishing in, in the pools at the beginning, um, you know, would your staff or, or the volunteers from your charity uh, recognise a, a phishing attack? Um, if not, you know, where does that leave your your your, your charity? Um, I think can I, can I just can I just jump in there? I think the other point to make about that is that, and I guess this is a, a result of home working as well, is that if people click on a link, that sudden you know they suddenly think, oh goodness, why did I click on that link? That's probably a phishing link. Then some people are, are not going to report that. They're going to be worried that that's going that, that, you know something's going to come down on their head and they could get fired. So I think one of the really important things is during the time when we work at home, maybe we don't have an IT department to help us out, that people are encouraged to report that they won't be fired if they suddenly think, oh crikey, I've clicked on a you know on a phishing link. Would you? Have have sympathy with that point of view yeah and, and, and i think uh, if, if if your staff aren't telling you uh, or your volunteers or, or your trustees aren't you know letting everyone know where that the, the, there's been this you can't deal with it uh, and coming back to that point at the beginning um you know when we talk about notifiable events um yeah. we encourage charities to to you know, get in touch with us we encourage them to tell us what they're doing about things that's the, the, that that's what counts and if the the, the the you know the rest of the trustees or, or the, the the charities who don't know about an incident you can't deal with it you can't show that you've dealt with it and and it starts snowballing from there i mean would would is it fair to say that uh, that with many people working from home um just looking at the pictures of people i'm seeing here today it looks like most people i'm seeing are working from home it, does this create uh further vulnerabilities is this the problem for organizations yeah i, I think you've got to think about what, what are the, what are the problems for that if, if, if you're you're working you know, on sort of distributed systems you have to think about the you know how people are are uh access near systems yeah and what, what, what the vulnerabilities are there and you know how does that matter and, and you know how much that matters will depend on what your charity does if you're a charity that has a lot of sensitive personal information about individuals uh then you really need to think about how you're handling that and, and you know how that's getting from uh your systems to your know, people's in, individual kit um, yeah, indeed, indeed. I mean, because security, it is going to be more difficult. The, you know, organ if you're working from home, you're less likely to have such um, security. Um, you know, other people might be using your computer and so forth. So I think there are there are issues, but maybe that those those are topics for another webinar, possibly. However, I think I think it's time to launch another poll. I think we should get our um, our guests involved here. So I've got I've got another poll. Let's see if I can manage to launch this poll. So the question is, if you are subject, and it, there may be more than one answer to this question, but I want to get people involved. If you are subject to a cyber attack, who should you communicate? with immediately and you know, let's see if i can uh, okay i'm just gonna shut okay here we go uh, here we go poll three there we go i'm launching the poll now uh, hopefully you can see that so if you are subject to a cyber attack who should you communicate with immediately um, if you could vote on this please people scratching their heads here um and how many we got 23 percent we need we need more than 26 percent of people have voted all right here we go people are getting their answers together now more than half now all right we're just gonna wait for a second while you vote we got up to 63 percent so who should you call staff media regulator information commissioner's office your babysitter no i just made that one up uh customers and suppliers so who should you uh all right we're up to 83 percent anybody else last dibs um and i'm going to shut the poll and i'm going to share the results 
So, Martin, what do you think about this? Who should, all right, I'm going to put you on the spot, Martin. Who should you call? <laughs> I think it depends what the, the you know, what the, the nature of the breach has been, uh, and I think you know, for instance, if there there has been a, a, a sort of loss of, of, of personal data, then you know, definitely the, the information commissioner's uh, office is, is is where you go. Uh, I think similarly for this, if it's uh, you've know, been you know, had that sort of significance, then uh, you know, us. Um, staff and, and 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 customers. Well, I, I think some of that is is a bit more situation dependent. Um, and you know the, the, this is one of these things where uh, you need to think about the nature of the breach, but you need to you probably have thought about some of these situations beforehand and and have some protocols and, and, and thoughts about uh, what you would do uh, and, and what your particular issues are likely to be. I sat with some people from the Information Commissioner's Office last year, and I think, what is it, 72 hours? You have, If you've had a data breach or a cyber attack, you have to get in touch with them. And they were saying quite clearly, I suppose they would say this, that they would expect people to do that much quicker than that. And that, would, yeah. that was kind of last dibs, if you like. Yeah. And, you know, for, for instance, in, in the case that we've been talking about, you know, they did that very quickly. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that that that, that was something that uh, was recognised by the Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, you know, when oh, they, right. They they got in touch with them straight away. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, I'm, I, am I right? In, no, I'm I'm getting off on something else. Now, leave that, Jim. I'm, it's not nothing to do with charity, so we'll leave that. Um. So, all right, great. Well, look, what what I'd like to do in our remaining time is um. Sometimes on webinars like this, we're always criticized for criticizing people for uh, sort of laying down the law and, and showing where people have gone wrong. A lot of people, I'm sure most people listening to this, this is the hack at the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, uh, which is a pretty interesting story anyway. A lot of people have been saying that they've handled this quite well. Um, Martin, would you lay out just quickly what happened or do you want me to do that? If, if, if you want to do that, yeah. Yeah, sure. So the, 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 the agency was hacked. Um, a lot of data was put out there. Um, but the major kind of issue was that they were hit with a ransom demand, a big ransom demand um, to, uh, to, um, to stop data being put on the dark web. And they didn't pay it. They refused to pay it. And this has caused them a degree of problem, a, you know, quite a bit of problem. But a lot of people have praised them for not um, uh, for not paying the ransom and uh, and sticking with it. So, any any thoughts on this for our audience, Martin? Please. I, it, it, that 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 is an interesting one because uh, you know, one of you know, part of the consequence of the the, the attack was uh, they were not able to, to exercise some of their their, their, their key functions, and that's a, yeah. a very difficult okay. uh, position for a, for a, a public body to, to, to be in not all of them uh, you know the, the, there were things that they could still do and I think particularly some of their emergency functions in terms of environmental incidents um, but the, 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 that, that's a very tough situation to be in and you know the, the, they obviously you know, I think decided quite early on to take a, a, a sort of tough line with it. I mean, just just in general terms, I, I was doing an exercise a couple of years ago now with a bank, and I know we're not talking about the um, we're talking about charities, but there was a major bank, and we, we were doing an exercise, and part of the exercise was a ransom demand, and the bank didn't have a policy on ransom demand. So all I would say is, if you work in the charity sector, it's really important these days with the amount of malware, ransomware, that people actually do as much as they can ahead of time figure out what their policy is on it i i think that that, that, that general point about you know, having some sense uh, uh, you know, ahead of time and, uh, and you're know, thinking about what the scenarios might be for your charity what are the functions that you need to keep going for instance what what, what is it that, that would really sort of challenge the the, the core business of, of your charity its, its ability to deliver what do you need to protect I mean, someone is saying here, you know, what what should charities do? I mean, should you pay the ransom in general? I'm guessing the answer to that is no, you shouldn't. Um, well, I, I, I think uh, that would be uh, a very awkward use of uh, charitable assets. Uh, yeah. I think you're very, you know, very questionable and, and, and very challengeable. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, Alison has just put up NCSC National Cyber Security Centre guidance and police advice is not to pay the yeah, ransom. But, uh, but, but, but of course, as we know, people and indeed governments do, but uh, maybe we're getting into deep water there. Um, anything more to say about um, the Scottish Environment Agency, Martin, or are we good on that? You know, I, I, I think the, the, you know, the, the, the big point there is, is you know, just how um, you know, concerning and, and, and how badly affected a, a, an organisation can be. And, and that, that, that is one that, that, that you know, has, has probably had a, a quite a good response to it, a, a response that's been regarded as good, but that, that, that's been a very tough time for them. Indeed, indeed it has. All right. Well, I think we're just about, if anybody has any more questions, please put them in the chat box. But I think I'm going to hand back to Alison now, who I can see there. And Alison is just going to um, take us through some further resources and I think some information about further events that are taking place for the Scotland Cyber Week. So, Alison, back to you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, that was a really, really interesting session um, and some good takeaways about the importance of having your, your ducks in a row and your plans in place to deal with anything that should get thrown at you. Um, I think, yeah, the importance of thinking through your risks, getting your, your, your plans about what your vulnerabilities are um, and your crisis comms type stuff together is really important. Um, Think a little takeaway on the the, the CEPA attack. Um, the timing of that was incredibly interesting. Uh, I, I don't know how much people know about this and how much is actually in the public domain as yet. Um, but this attack was actually on Christmas Eve, um, so they 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 uh, instigated an attack at the time when most of us were putting up our Christmas stockings and having our first cherry of the Christmas holidays. So, so they were really up against you know, dealing with an attack, not knowing what it was that they were dealing with, um, with really unfortunate timing. Um, so uh, all, all hats off to see, but they've actually done quite a good job. Um, and one of the things that, that certainly we talk about in Cyber Resilience Unit is, is the, how they have collaborated with NCSC, with Scottish Government Cyber Resilience Unit to try and recover from this so, so it's actually a really good and strong case study on on something that has been really not very good and they are still recovering um but they have managed it to the best of their abilities so so it's an interesting story and and we'll make cyber professionals a lovely case story for study for, for years to come perhaps we better do a, do a webinar on that shortly then yeah i think that's next year's cyber scholar week maybe <laughs> So coming back to Cyber Scotland Week, um, this is, is Wednesday. I'm sure it's Wednesday. Uh, this is the third day of, of a week of, of really fantastic stuff. Um, Edward asked a question earlier on about what a cyber attack is. Um, and I, 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 I gave him, kind of gave him a little bit of an answer saying there's lots of other stuff, other events out there that will explain over and above what, that what we're doing today, that you know, that what what this is all about, um, and that's just one of 140 odd events that are available this week that I would encourage people to avail themselves of. Um, I put the link to the Cyber Scotland website in the the chat, so anybody who wants to have a look and see what else is in the program. And I have to warn you, it's looking a little bit like the Edinburgh Fringe program at the moment. There's just so much choice, um, but there's another two and a half days of brilliant stuff to to avail yourself of. Um, Coming back to response and recovery, um, the NCSC, the National Cyber Security Centre, who are the, the oracle on all things cyber, have some fantastic guidance um, on keeping your, your charity safe. Um, they've got a small charities guide. Um, they have a board toolkit if you want to get uh, cyber resilience as, as a discussion onto the, the risk register, onto the board agenda. Um, they've got some tools to help you do that. Um, but they also have produced a, an excellent guide on response and recovery. Um, it's it's a two part guide. It looks at those ducks that you need to get into into a row before, or well, God forbid, you should ever be attacked. Uh, but it's stuff that you need to think about now. But it also gives you some very helpful advice, or should you be attacked, as to what it is that you need to to take on, to consider, and and do to start getting yourself into a position where you can recover quite successfully. Um, the other thing that is worth mentioning to third sector organisations, um, it's a relatively new thing and it's a service that's offered by the Scottish Business Resilience Centre um, and they have um, implemented quite recently a support and incident response helpline. Um, this is available to SMEs, third sector organisations, should they be the subject of a data breach or a subject, uh, a, sorry, a cyber attack. Um, and it will give you that, that helping hand to get over the, the, the initial, oh my God, what do we do? Um, they've got technical experts that will say, okay, this is what it's all about. This is what you need to do to, do to recover. And they will help you do that. 
Um, and if it's beyond the, the capability of the first line support that they have, um, they can triage you to, to specialists that can help you get over this, this hump and manage your, your incident in a, in a proactive and professional way. Um, I hope you never need to use it, um, but it's certainly a bear, uh, there and I would encourage anybody who was, was feeling that they needed a little bit of helping hand to do that. Um, Alison, Alison, can I just jump in here and just put in a word for another thing the NCSC do, which is which I've just been looking at is from home for home working, which we touched on a little bit in our talks. They've got some great videos about staying safe, staying cyber safe at home when you're working from home. And it's something I think a lot all organizations need to look at uh, to make sure that um, they keep their staff and uh, their organization as safe as possible. Absolutely. Um, I, I put a link to their home working guidance in the, the chat earlier on. Um, have a dig in the NCSE website. It has some fantastic resources. Um, there's a lot of information out there on bring your own device, which has become kind of a thing since we've all been during the pandemic, people working on their own devices. Um, it's got a whole raft of information that will help charities become more cyber resilient. Um, and yeah, I would just encourage anybody this week to, to if you know, they're, they're, they're curious or interested in this stuff, have a look to see what's in the Cyber Scotland Week programme and book another couple of sessions because the education that is available this week and, and on an ongoing basis is there for you. Just make sure you avail yourself of it um, because lots of people are here to help you. Cyber yeah. is a, a little bit scary to many, many people. We use a lot of jargon. We, we, we talk about our malwares and our social engineerings, but please don't be frightened of it. They're, they're, it's, it's just another business risk at the end of the day. And charities need to view it as just another business risk and not be scared by the, the, the talk of technology. Um, the other thing that is worth reiterating is it's not an IT thing either. It's in every person in the organization um, from your staff, it includes your, your, your volunteers or your employees. So make sure everybody gets involved in this uh, and you share the messaging to everybody that you can. Yeah, and, and just you know, a couple of questions that, that we've had uh, sort of along the way about this, uh, you know, what kind of support uh, you know, is on the OSCAR website in, in these areas and also what kind of help can uh, bodies like the, the, the third sector interfaces uh, give to, to charities? Mm -hmm. I think in terms of, of the sort of specifics of uh, cyber attacks and, and uh, data breaches and security, I think the, the uh, you know the stuff that's on on the NCSC and, and the cyber resilience the, the cyber resilience unit put out, that's where where to go for the specifics because like you know it's got to be current, it's going to be very specific. But you're right there, you know, this is a whole charity issue and, and it, it's a sort of business risk. So I think in terms of, of what we can do and, and what the, the third sector interface can do, it is, you know, back to the basics of, uh, of good governance, uh, how charity trustees go about their, their business and, you know, how they ask the right questions and make sure they keep challenging each other uh, and, and, and keep, you know, take care of business. Yeah, that, that's a that's a really really valid point, Martin. It's it, it's something that that can't be ignored. Um, we we ask people to take the attitude that it's it's not if it happens to your organisation, it's it's when it happens to your organisation. And a lot of people say to me, well, you know, we're we're, we're the Fed sector, we're charities, we're doing really good stuff. Why would anybody want to target us? Um, mm -hmm. And the answer to that is, is, is simply to a cyber criminal, you're you're no different from an organisation. You've got data, you've got money. Um, you, you know, you're, you're just a target to your cyber criminal um, who doesn't care what services you're delivering to your service users. Um, you're just a cash cow to them. So it's not something that the third sector can stick their head in the sand about. It's something that has to has to have a profile and has to be discussed. Absolutely. Any comments, Jim? No, I, I think I'm good. I think it's been a very valuable session. Great comments from Martin about the experience with Statecraft. I just hope that our audience find it useful and, you know, there's some good takeaways from them. But no, that, that's good. Cool. Do we want to open up the, 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 the floor to anybody in the audience to, to ask questions whilst we've got these experts here to, to challenge? Don't all rush at once. <laughs> Any questions, anybody? I love a stunned silence. <laughs> Brilliant. I think if there's no questions from anybody, um, 
that we will close up now. I hope it's been a useful session to you. Uh, I've certainly found it fascinating um, to learn about somebody a little bit about somebody else's experiences um, and certainly hoping that it never happens to anybody here. Um, but thank you very, very much for coming along. Thank you for being so, so candid and willing to share your experiences, Jim and Martin. Um, yeah, I, I think we'll close it up now. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye.